Chapter Twenty Nine of Historical Tales, Volume Three, Spanish American. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Historical Tales, Volume Three, Spanish American by Charles Morris. Chapter Twenty Nine, Walker the Filibuster and the Invasion of Nicaragua. On the fifteenth of October, eighteen fifty-three. A small and daring band of reckless adventurers sailed from San Francisco on an enterprise seemingly madder and wilder than that which Cortez had undertaken more than three centuries before. The purpose of this handful of men, filibusters they were called, as lawless in their way as the buccaneers of old, was the conquest of northwest Mexico, possibly in the end, of all Mexico and Central America. No one knows what wild vagaries filled the mind of William Walker, their leader the gray-eyed man of destiny, as his admirers called him. Landing at La Paz, in the southwestern corner of the Gulf of California, with his few companions, he captured a number of hamlets and then grandiloquently proclaimed Lower California an independent state and himself its president. His next proclamation annexed to his territory the large Mexican state of Sonora, on the mainland opposite the California Gulf, and for a brief period he posed among the sparse inhabitants as a ruler. Some reinforcements reached him by water, but another party that started overland was dispersed by starvation, their food giving out. Walker now set out, with his buccaneering band, on a long march of six hundred miles through a barren and unpeopled country, toward his possessions in the interior. The Mexicans did not need any forces to defeat him. Fatigue and famine did the work for them. Desertion decimated the band of invaders, and the hopeless march up the peninsula ended at San Diego where he and his men surrendered to the United States authorities. Walker was tried at San Francisco in 1854 for violation of the neutrality laws, but was acquitted. This pioneer attempted invasion only whetted Walker's filibustering appetite. Looking about for new worlds to conquer, he saw a promising field in Nicaragua, then torn by internal dissensions. Invited by certain American speculators or adventurers to lend his aid to the Democratic Party of insurrectionists, he did not hesitate, but at once collected a band of men of his own type, and set sail for this new field of labor and ambition. On the 11th of June, 1855, he landed with his small force of sixty-two men at Realijo, on the Nicaraguan coast, and was joined there by about a hundred of the native rebels. Making his way inland, his first encounter with the government forces took place at Rivas, where he met a force of four hundred and eighty men. His native allies fled at the first shots, but the Americans fought with such valor and energy that the enemy were defeated with the loss of one-third their number, his loss being only ten. In a second conflict at Virgin Bay he was equally successful, and on the 15th of October he captured the important city of Granada. These few successes gave him such prestige, and bought such aid from the revolutionists that the opposite party was quite ready for peace, and on the 25th he made a treaty with General Corral, its leader, which made him fairly master of the country. He declined the office of President, which was offered him, but accepted that of Generalissimo of the Republic, an office better suited to maintain his position. His rapid success brought him not only the support of the liberal faction, but attracted recruits from the United States who made their way into the country from the east and west alike, until he had a force of twelve hundred Americans under his command. General Corral, who had treated with him for peace, was soon to pay the penalty for his readiness to make terms with an invader. He was arrested for treason on some charge brought by Walker, tried before a court-martial at which the new Generalissimo presided, sentenced to death, and executed without delay. The next event in this fantastic drama of filibusterism was a war with the neighboring Republic of Costa Rica. Both sides mustered armies, and a hostile meeting took place at Guanacaste on March twentieth, 1856, in which Walker was worsted. He kept the field, however, and met the foe again at Rivas on April eleventh. This time he was victorious, and the two republics now made peace. His military success seemed to have made the invader securely the lord and master of Nicaragua, and he now threw aside his earlier show of modesty and had himself elected president on June 25th. He had so fully established himself that he was recognized as head of the republic by President Pierce on behalf of the United States, but he immediately began to act the master and tyrant in a way that was likely to bring his government to a speedy end. <laughs> 
Money being scarce, he issued currency on a liberal scale, and by a decree he restored the system of slavery which had been abolished thirty-two years before. Not content with these radical measures within the Republic itself, he was unwise enough to create for himself a powerful enemy in the United States by meddling with the privileges of the Vanderbilt Steamship Company, then engaged in transporting the stream of gold hunters to California over a Nicaraguan route. Walker revoked their charter and confiscated their property, thus bringing against his new government a fire in the rear. His aggressive policy, in fact, made him enemies on all sides, the Central American states bordering on Nicaragua being in sore dread of their ambitious neighbor, while the agents of the Vanderbilt Company worked industriously to stir up a revolt against this soaring eagle of filibusterism. The result was a strong revolt against his rule, and he soon found himself confronted by a force of patriots in the field. For a short time there were busy times in Nicaragua, several battles being fought by the contending forces, the war ending with the burning of Granada by the President. Finding that the whole country was rising against him and that his case had grown desperate, Walker soon gave up the hopeless contest and surrendered on May 1, 1857, to Commodore C. H. Davis of the United States Sloop of War, St. Mary, who took him to Panama, where he made his way back to the United States. Thus closed the conquering career of this minor Cortez of the nineteenth century. But while Walker the President was no more, Walker the filibuster was not squelched. The passion for adventure was as strong in his mind as ever, and his brief period of power had roused in him an unquenchable thirst for rule. In consequence he made effort after effort to get back to the scene of his exploits and rise to power again, his persistent thirst for invasion giving the United States authorities no small trouble and ending only with his death. In fact, he was barely at home before he was hatching new schemes and devising fresh exploits. To check a new expedition which he was organizing in New Orleans, the authorities of that city had him arrested and put under bonds to keep the peace. Soon after that, we find him escaping their jurisdiction in a vessel ostensibly bound for Mobile, yet making port first in Central America, where he landed on November 25, 1857. This effort at invasion proved a mere flash in the pan. No support awaited him and his deluded followers, and in two weeks' time he found it judicious to surrender once more to the naval authorities of the United States, this time to Commodore Paulding, who took him to New York with his followers, one hundred and thirty-two in number. His fiasco stirred up something of a breeze in the United States. President Buchanan had strongly condemned the invasion of friendly territory in his annual message, but he now sent a special message to Congress in which he equally condemned Commodore Paulding for landing an American force on foreign soil. He decided that under the circumstances, the government must decline to hold Walker as a prisoner unless he was properly arrested under judicial authority. At the same time, Buchanan strongly deprecated all filibustering expeditions. The result of this was that Walker was again set free, and it was not long before he had a new following, there being many of the adventurous class who sympathized warmly with his enterprising efforts. This was especially the case in the South. Thither Walker proceeded, and inspired by his old enthusiasm, he soon organized another company, which sought to leave the country in October 1858. He was closely watched, however, and the whole company was arrested at the mouth of the Mississippi on the steamer on which passage had been taken. President Buchanan had issued a proclamation forbidding all such expeditions, and Walker was now put on trial before the United States Court at New Orleans. But the case against him seemed to lack satisfactory evidence, and he was acquitted. Desisting for a time from his efforts, Walker occupied himself in writing an account of his exploits in a book entitled The War in Nicaragua. But this was far too tame work for one of his stirring disposition, and in June 1860 he was off again this time making Honduras the scene of his invading energy. Landing at Trujillo on the 27th, he seized that town and held it for eight weeks, at the end of which time he was ordered to leave the place by the captain of a British man-of-war. The president of Honduras was rapidly approaching with a defensive force. Walker marched south, but his force was too small to cope with the president's army, and he had not gone far before he found himself a captive in the hands of the Honduran government. Central America had by this time more than enough of William Walker and his methods, and five days after his capture he was condemned to death and shot at Trujillo. Thus ended the somewhat remarkable career of the chief of filibusters, the most persistent of modern invaders of foreign lands, whose reckless exploits were of the medieval rather than of the modern type. 
a short, slender, not especially demonstrative man, Walker did not seem made for a hero of enthusiastic adventure. His most striking feature was his keen gray eyes, which brought him the title of the Gray-Eyed Man of Destiny. End of chapter 29《Chapter Thirty of Historical Tales, Volume Three, Spanish American. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.《Historical Tales, Volume Three, Spanish American by Charles Morris. Chapter Thirty: Maximilian of Austria and His Empire in Mexico. It is interesting, in view of the total conquest and submission of the Indians in Mexico that the final blow for freedom in that country should have been made by an Indian of pure native blood. His name was Benito Juarez, and his struggle for liberty was against the French invaders and Maximilian the puppet emperor, put by Louis Napoleon on the Mexican throne. In the words of Shakespeare, thereby hangs a tale. For many years after the Spanish colonies had won their independence, the nations of Europe looked upon them with a covetous eye. They would dearly have liked to snap up some of these weak countries, which Spain had been unable to hold. But the great republic of the United States stood as their protector, and none of them felt it quite safe to step over that threatening bar to ambition, the Monroe Doctrine. "'Hands off,' said Uncle Sam, and they obeyed, though much against their will. In 1861 began a war in the United States which gave the people of that country all they wanted to do. Here was the chance for Europe— and Napoleon III, the usurper of France, took advantage of it to send an army to Mexico and attempt the conquest of that country. It was the overweening ambition of Louis Napoleon which led him on. It was his scheme to found an empire in Mexico, which, while having the name of being independent, would be under the control of France and would shed glory on his reign. At that time the president of Mexico, the Indian we have named, was Benito Juarez, a descendant of the Aztec race, and, as some said, with the blood of the Montezumas in his veins. Yet his family was of the lowest class of the Indians, and when he was twelve years old he did not know how to read or write. After that he obtained a chance for education, and in time became a lawyer, was made governor of his native state, and kept on climbing upward, till he became secretary of state, president of the Supreme Court, and finally president of Mexico. He was the man who had the invaders of his country to fight, and fought them well and long. But the poor and undisciplined Mexicans were no match for the trained troops of France, and they were driven back step by step until the invaders were masters of nearly the whole country. Yet Juarez still had a capital and a government at San Luis Potosi, and all loyal Mexicans still looked on him as their president. When Napoleon III found himself master of Mexico, he looked around for a man who would serve him as a tool to hold the country. Such a man he found in Ferdinand Joseph Maximilian, the brother of the Emperor of Austria, a dreamer rather than a man of action, and a fervent believer in the divine right of kings. This was the kind of man that the French usurper was in want of, and he offered him the position of Emperor of Mexico. Maximilian was taken by surprise. The proposition was a startling one. But in the end, ambition overcame judgment, and he accepted the lofty but perilous position, on the condition that France should sustain him on the throne. The struggle of the Mexicans for freedom was for the time at an end, and the French had almost everywhere prevailed, when in 1864 the new emperor and his young wife Carlotta arrived at Vera Cruz and made their way to the city of Mexico. This they entered with great show and ceremony, and amid the cheers of many of the lookers-on, though the mass of the people, who had no love for emperors, kept away or held their peace. The new empire began with imperial display. All the higher society of Mexico were at the feet of the new monarchs. With French money to pay their way and a French army to protect them, there was nothing for Maximilian and Carlotta to do but enjoy the romance and splendor of their new dignity. On the summit of the hill of Chapultepec, two hundred feet above the valley, stood the old palace which had been ruined by the American guns when Scott invaded Mexico. This was rebuilt by Maximilian on a grand scale. Hanging gardens were constructed and walled in by galleries with marble columns, costly furniture was brought from Europe, and here the new emperor and empress held their court, with a brilliant succession of fetes, dinners, dances, and receptions.' 
all was brilliance and gaiety, and as yet no shadow fell on their dream of proud and royal reign. But the shadow was coming. Maximilian had reached Mexico in June 1864. For a year longer the civil war in the Great Republic of the North continued. Then it came to an end, and the government of the United States was free to take a hand in the arbitrary doings on the soil of her near neighbor to the south. It was a sad blow to the ambitious schemes of Napoleon. It was like the rumble of an earthquake under the throne of Maximilian, when from Washington came a diplomatic demand which, translated into plain English, meant, you had better make haste to get your armies out of Mexico. If they stay there, you will have the United States to deal with. It hurt Louis Napoleon's pride. He shifted and prevaricated and delayed, but the hand of the great republic was on the throat of his new empire, and there was nothing for him to do but obey. He knew very well that if he resisted, the armies of the Civil War would make very short work of his forces in Mexico. Maximilian was strongly advised to give up his dream of an empire and leave the country with the French. He changed his mind a half a dozen times, but finally decided to stay, fancying that he could hold his throne with the aid of the loyal Mexicans. Carlotta, full of ambition, went to Europe and appealed for help to Napoleon. She told him very plainly what she thought of his actions, but it was all of no avail, and she left the palace almost broken-hearted. Soon after, Maximilian received the distressing news that his wife had lost her reason through grief and was quite insane. At once he made up his mind to return to Europe, and set out for Veracruz. But before he got there he changed his mind again and concluded to remain. At the end of January 1867, the French army, which had held on till then, with one excuse after another, left the capital city which it had occupied for years, and began its long march to the seashore at Veracruz. Much was left behind. Cannon were broken up as useless, horses sold for a song, and the evacuation was soon complete. The Belgian and Austrian troops which the new emperor had brought with him, going with the French, Maximilian did not want them. He preferred to trust himself to the loyal arms of his Mexican subjects, hoping thus to avoid jealousy. As for the United States, it had no more to say. It was content to leave this shadow of an empire to its loyal Mexicans. It cannot be said that Maximilian had taken the right course to make himself beloved by the Mexicans. Full of his obsolete notion of the divine right of kings, a year after he had reached Mexico he issued a decree saying that all who clung to the Republic, or resisted, his authority should be shot. And this was not waste paper like so many decrees, for a number of prisoners were shot under its cruel mandate, one of them being General Orteaga. It has been said that Maximilian went so far as to order that the whole laboring population of the country should be reduced to slavery. While all this was going on, President Juarez was not idle. During the whole French occupation he had kept in arms, and now began his advance from his place of refuge in the north. General Escobedo, chief of his armies, soon conquered the northern part of the country, and occupied the various states and cities as soon as they were left by the French. But neither was Maximilian idle. Agents of the church party had finally induced him to remain, and this party now came to his aid. General Miramon, an able leader, commanded his army, which was recruited to the strength of eight thousand men, most of them trained soldiers, though nearly half of them were raw recruits. With this force Maximilian advanced to Queretaro and made it his headquarters. Juarez had, meanwhile, advanced to Zacatecas and fixed his residence there with his government about him. But the president and cabinet came very near being taken captive at one fell swoop, for Miramon suddenly advanced and captured Zacatecas by surprise. Juarez and his government barely escaping. What would have been the result if the whole Mexican government had been taken prisoners is not easy to say. Not unlikely, however, General Escobedo would have done what he now did, which was to advance on Querétaro and invest it with his army. Thus, the empire of Maximilian was limited to this one town where it was besieged by an army of Mexican patriots while, with the exception of a few cities, the whole country outside was free from imperial rule. Soon the emperor and his army found themselves closely confined within the walls of Queretaro. Skirmishes took place almost daily, in which both sides fought with courage and resolution. Provisions grew scarce and foraging parties were sent out, but after each attack the lines of the besiegers became closer, 
the clergy had made liberal promises of forces and funds, and General Marquez was sent to the city of Mexico to obtain them. He managed to get through the lines of Escobedo, but he failed to return, and nothing was ever seen by Maximilian of the promised aid. Such forces and funds as Marquez obtained he used in attacking General Diaz, who was advancing on Pueblo. Diaz besieged and took Pueblo, and then turned on Marquez, whom he defeated so completely that he made his way back to Mexico almost alone under cover of the night. It was the glory gained by this act that later raised Diaz to the presidency, which he held so brilliantly for so many years. The hopes of Maximilian were dwindling to a shadow. For two months the siege of Querétaro continued, steadily growing closer. During this trying time Maximilian showed the best elements of his character. He was gentle and cheerful in demeanor, and brave in action, not hesitating to expose himself to the fire of the enemy. Plans were made for his escape, that he might put himself at the head of his troops elsewhere, but he refused, through a sense of honor, to desert his brave companions. Daily provisions grew scarcer, and Maximilian himself had only the coarse, tough food which was served to the common soldiers. Day after day Marquez was looked for with the promised aid, but night after night brought only disappointment. At length on the night of May 14th, General Lopez, in charge of the most important point in the city, turned traitor and admitted two battalions of the enemy. From this point the assailants swarmed into the city, where terror and confusion everywhere prevailed. Lopez had not intended that the emperor should be captured, and gave him warning in time to escape. He attempted to do so, and reached a little hill outside the town, but here he was surrounded by foes and forced to deliver up his sword. Juarez, the Indian president, was at length full master of Mexico, and held its late emperor in his hands. The fate of Maximilian depended upon his word. Plans indeed were made for his escape, but always at the last moment he failed to avail himself of them. His friends sought to win for him the clemency of Juarez, but they found him inflexible. The traitors, as he called them, should be tried by court-martial, he said, and abide the decision of the court. Tried they were, though the trial was little more than a farce, with the verdict fixed in advance. This verdict was death. The condemned, in addition to Maximilian, were his chiefs in command, Miramon and Medier. The late emperor rose early on the fatal morning and heard mass. He embraced his fellow victims, and as he reached the street said, What a beautiful day! On such a one I have always wished to die. He was greeted with respect by the people in the street, the women weeping. He responded with a brief address, closing with the words, May my blood be the last spilt for the welfare of the country, and if more should be shed, may it flow for its good and not by treason. Viva Independencia! Viva Mexico! In a few minutes more the fatal shots were fired, and the empire of Maximilian was at an end. End of chapter 30「Chapter thirty one of Historical Tales, Volume three, Spanish American. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Historical Tales, Volume three, Spanish American, by Charles Morris. Chapter thirty one Maceo and the Struggle for Cuban Independence. On the twenty fourth of February, eighteen ninety five, the people of Havana, the capital of Cuba, were startled by a report that rebels were in the field a band of twenty-four having appeared in arms at Ibarra, in the province of Matanzas. Other small bands were soon heard of elsewhere in the island. A trifle this seemed, in view of the fact that Cuba was guarded by twenty thousand Spanish troops, and had on its military rolls the names of sixty thousand volunteers. But the island was seething with discontent, and trifles grow fast under such circumstances. Twenty years before a great rebellion had been afoot. It was settled by treaty in 1878, but Spain had ignored the promises of the treaty, and steadily heaped up fuel for the new flame which had now burst out. As the days and weeks went on the movement grew, many of the plantation hands joining the insurgents, until there were several thousand men in Arias. For a time these had it all their own way, raiding and plundering the plantations of the loyalists and vanishing into the woods and mountains when the troops appeared. The war to which this led was not one of the picturesque old affairs of battle and banners, marches and campaigns. It displayed none of the pomp and circumstance of glorious war, 
forest ambushes, sudden attacks, quick retreats, and brisk affrays that led to nothing forming the staple of the conflict. The patriots had no hope of triumphing over the armed and trained troops of Spain, but they hoped to wear them out and make the war so costly to Spain that she would in the end give up the island in despair. The work of the Cuban patriots was like the famous deeds of Marion and his men in the swampy region of the Carolina coast. Two-thirds of Cuba were uncultivated, and half its area was covered with thickets and forests. In the wet season the lowlands of the coast were turned into swamps of sticky black mud. Underbrush filled the forests, so thick and dense as to be almost impassable. The high bushes and thick grasses of the plains formed a jungle which could be traversed only with the aid of the machete, the heavy, sharp, cutlass-like blade which the Cuban uses both as tool and sword, now cutting his way through bush and jungle, now slicing off the head of an enemy in war. Everywhere in the island there were woods, there were hills and mountains, there were growths of lofty grass, affording countless recesses and refuges for fugitives, and lurking places for ambushed foes. To retire to the long grass is a Cuban phrase meaning to gain safety from pursuit, and a patriot force might lie unseen and unheard while an army marched by. In brief, Cuba is a paradise for the bushfighter, and the soldiers of Spain were none too eager to venture into the rebel haunts where the flame of death might suddenly burst forth from the most innocent-looking woodland retreat or grass-grown mead. The soldiers might search for days for a foe who could not be found, and as for starving out the rebels, that was no easy thing to do. There were the yam, the banana, the sweet potato, the wild fruits of the woodland which the fertile soil bore abundantly, while the country people were always ready to supply their brothers in the field. Such was the state of affairs in Cuba in the rebellion of 1895. For a time the rebels gathered in small bands with none but local leaders. But the outbreak had been fomented by agents afar, fugitives from the former war, and early in April twenty-four of these exiles arrived from Costa Rica, landing secretly at a point near the eastern end of the island. Chief among the newcomers was Antonio Maceo, a mulatto who had won a high reputation for his daring and skill in the past conflict, and who had unbounded influence over the negro element of the rebellion. Wherever Maceo was ready to lead, they were ready to follow to the death if he gave the word, and soon proved himself the most daring and successful soldier in the war. He did not make his way inland with safety. Spanish cavalry were patrolling the coast to prevent landings, and Maceo and his comrades had a brisk fight with a party of these soon after landing he getting away with a bullet-hole through his hat. For ten days they were in imminent danger, now fighting, now hiding, now seeking the wild woodland fruits for food, and so pestered by the Spanish patrols that the party was forced to break up, only two or three remaining with Maceo. In the end these fell in with a party of rebels from whom they received a warm and enthusiastic welcome. Maceo was a rebel in grain. He was the only one of the leaders in the former war who had refused to sign the Treaty of Peace. He had kept up the fight for two months longer, and finally escaped from the country, now to return without the load of a broken promise on his conscience. The new leader of the rebellion soon had a large following of insurgents at his back, and in several sharp brushes with the enemy proved that he could more than hold his own. Other patriots soon arrived from exile. José Marti, the fomenter of the insurrection, Maximo Gomez, an able soldier, and several more whose presence gave fresh spirit to the rebels. The movement, which had as yet been a mere hasty outbreak, was now assuming the dimensions of a regular war, hundreds of patriots joining the ranks of these able leaders, until more than six thousand men were in the field. Almost everywhere that they met their enemy they were largely outnumbered, and they fought mostly from ambush, striking their blows when least expected, and vanishing so suddenly and by such hidden paths that pursuit was usually idle. Much of their strength lay in their horses. No Cossacks or cowboys could surpass them as riders, in which art they were far superior to the Spanish cavalry. Many stories are told of women who rode in their ranks and wielded the machete as boldly and skillfully as the men, and in this there is doubtless much truth. Their horses were no show animals, but a sore-backed, sorry lot, fed on rushes or coya there being no other grain, left standing unsheltered rain or shine, but as tough and tireless beasts as our own broncos, and ever ready to second their riders in mad dashes on the foe. The favorite mode of fighting practiced by the insurgents was to surprise the enemy by a sharp skirmish fire. 
their sharpshooters seeking to pick off the officers. Then, if there was a fair opportunity, they would dash from their covert in a wild cavalry charge, machete in hand, and yelling like so many demons, and seek to make havoc in the ranks of the foe. This was the kind of fighting in which Maceo excelled. Through 1895 the war went on with endless skirmishes and only one affair that could be called a battle. In this Maceo was the insurgent general, while Martinez Campos, governor-general of Cuba, a man looked upon as the ablest general of Spain, led the Spanish troops. Maceo had caused great annoyance by attacks on trainloads of food for the fortified town of Bayamo, and Campos determined to drive him from the field. Several columns of Spanish troops were set in motion upon him from different quarters, one of these fifteen hundred strong led by Campos himself. On the 13th of July the two armies met, Maceo with nearly three thousand men being posted on a stock farm several miles from Bayamo. The fight began with a sharp attack on the Spaniards intended to strike the division under Campos, but by an error it fell upon the advance guard led by General Santosildes, which was saluted by a brisk fire from the wooded hillsides. Santosildes fell dead, and a bullet tore the heel from the governor-general's boot. Maceo, surmising from the confusion in the Spanish ranks that some important officer had fallen, now launched his horsemen upon them in a vigorous machete charge. Though Campos succeeded in repelling them, he felt himself in a critical situation, and hastily drew up his whole force into a hollow square, with the wagons and the dead horses and mules for breastworks. Around this strong formation the Cubans raged for several hours, only the skill of Campos saving his men from a disastrous rout. An assault was made on the rear guard early in the affray, Maceo hoping to capture the ammunition train, but its defenders held their ground vigorously and fought their way to the main column, where they aided to form the square. Finally the Spaniards succeeded in reaching Bayamo, pursued by the Cubans and having lost heavily in the fight. They were saved from utter destruction by Maceo's lack of artillery, and Campos was very careful afterwards not to venture near this daring leader without a powerful force. Maximo Gomez, one of the principal leaders in the earlier war, had now been appointed commander-in-chief of the Cuban forces, with Antonio Maceo as his lieutenant-general. He had made his way westward into the province of Santa Clara, and in November Maceo left the eastern province of Santiago de Cuba to join him. In his way lay the troca, the famous device of the Spaniards to prevent the free movement of the Cuban forces. It may be of interest to describe this new idea in warfare, devised by the Spaniards to check the free movement of their rebel foes. The word troca means trench, but the Spanish trocas were military lines cut through the woods and across the island from side to side, and defended by barbed wire fences, while the felled trees were piled along both sides of the roadway making a difficult breastwork of jagged roots and branches. At intervals of a quarter mile or more along this well-guarded avenue were forts, each with a garrison of about one hundred men, it needing about fifteen thousand to defend the whole line of the troca from sea to sea. Such was the elaborate device adopted by Campos and by Weiler after him to check the Cuban movements. We need not only say here that despite its cost and the number of men it tied up on guard duty, the troca failed to restrain the alert islanders. Gomez had crossed it in his movement westward, and Maceo now followed with equal readiness. He made a feint of an attack in force on one part of the line, and when the Spaniards had concentrated to defend this point, he crossed at an unprotected spot without firing a shot or losing a man. Westward still went the Cubans, heedless of trocas or Spaniards. From Santa Clara they entered Matanza's province, and from this made their way into the province of Havana bringing the war almost to the gates of the capital. Spain had now sent more than one hundred thousand troops across the ocean, though many of these were in the hospitals. As for the Cubans, the island had now risen almost from end to end, and their force was estimated from thirty to fifty thousand men. It was no longer a rebel outbreak that Spain had to deal with. It was a national war. By the end of the year the Cubans were firmly fixed in Havana province, many negro field hands and Cuban youths having joined their ranks. They fought not only against the Spaniards, but against the bandits also, of whom there were many abroad plundering from both sides alike. These were hanged by the patriots whenever captured. Maceo was the active fighter of the force, Gomez being occupied in burning sugar-cane fields and destroying railroads so as to deprive Spain of the sinews of war. In January 1896, 
a new movement westward was made, Maceo leading his men into the province of Pinar del Rio, which occupies the western end of the island. Here was the great tobacco district, one into which insurrection had never before made its way. Within a year, rebellion had covered the island from end to end, the Spaniards being secure nowhere but within the cities, while the insurgents moved wherever they chose in the country. The sky around the capital was heavy with smoke by day and lurid with the flames of burning fields at night, showing that Gomez was busy with his work of destruction, burning the crops of every planter who sought to grind his cane. Let us now follow the daring mulatto leader through the remainder of his career. General Wylard had now succeeded Campos, and began his official life with the boast that he would soon clear the provinces near Havana of rebels in arms. But he was hardly in the governor's chair when Maceo was back from the west and swooping down on the city of Haruco, which he looted and burned. Wyler sent troops into Pinar del Rio, where they found no one to oppose them, and he was soon able to inform the world by a proclamation that this province was pacified. But the ink was barely dry upon it when Maceo, having burned the port of Batabano, on the southern coast, was back in the pacified province where he made his headquarters in the mountains and defied all the power of Spain. Instead of seeking him here, Wyler now attempted to confine him by building a new troca, cutting off that end of the island. This took two months to complete, during which Maceo continued his work almost unopposed, destroying the tobacco of loyalists, defeating every force sent against him, and leaving to Spain only four fortified cities in the southern part of the province. Not until autumn opened did Weiler take the field, marching into Pinar del Rio at the head of thirty thousand men, confident now of putting an end to the work of his persistent foe, whom he felt sure he had hemmed in with his troca. Between the two forces, Spanish and Cuban, the province was sadly harried, and became so incapable of supporting a large force that Maceo was obliged to dismiss the most of his men. Leaving the slender remnant under the control of one of his lieutenants, he once more passed the troca, this time rowing round its end in a boat and landing in Havana province. He had sent orders in advance for a concentration of the Cuban forces in this region that he might give Weiler a new employment. The daring partisan leader was near the end of his career, brought to his death by the work of a traitor, as was widely believed. While waiting for the gathering of the forces, he, with the few men with him, was fired on from a Spanish ambush and fell mortally wounded. Thus died the most dashing soldier that the Cuban rebellion called into the field. Dr. Sertuca, of his staff, was charged with treachery in leading him into this ambush, though that is by no means proved. Maceo was one of his nine brothers, all soldiers, and all of whom had now died in the great struggle for Cuban independence. His body was recovered from the enemy after a desperate fight. His valiant spirit was lost to the cause. Yet his work had not been without avail, and the country for which he had fought so bravely was left by him on the high road to liberty. End of chapter 31《Chapter Thirty Two of Historical Tales, Volume Three, Spanish American. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. *** Historical Tales, Volume Three, Spanish American, by Charles Morris. *** Chapter Thirty Two, Lieutenant Hobson and the Sinking of the Merrimack. About three o'clock of a dark morning, whose deep gloom shrouded alike the shores and waters of Cuba's tropic isle. A large craft left the side of the New York, the flagship of Admiral Sampson's fleet off Santiago, and glided towards the throat of the narrow channel leading to its landlocked harbor. This mysterious craft was an old coal carrier named the Merrimack. On board were Richmond P. Hobson, assistant naval constructor, and seven volunteer seamen. Their purpose was to sink the old hulk in the channel and thus to seal up the Spanish ships in Santiago Harbor. The fact that there were ten chances to one that they would go to the bottom with their craft or be riddled with Spanish bullets did not trouble their daring souls. Their country called, and they obeyed. Ranged along the sides of the ship below decks was a series of torpedoes, prepared to blow the vessel into a hopeless wreck when the proper moment came. A heavy weight in coal had been left on board to carry her rapidly to the bottom, and there was a strong hope that she could be dropped in the channel like a cork in the neck of a bottle, and bottle up. Admiral Cervera and his cruisers. That it was an errand of imminent risk did not trouble the bold American tars. 
there were volunteers enough eager to undertake the perilous task to form a ship's crew, and to the six seamen chosen, Coxswain Clausen added himself as a stowaway. The love of adventure was stronger than fear of death or captivity. It was the morning of June 3, 1898. During the night before, an attempt to go in had been made, but the hour was so late that the Admiral called the vessel back. Now an earlier start was made, and there was no hindrance to the adventurous voyage. Heavy clouds hid the moon as the Merrimack glided in towards the dark line of the coast. Not a light was shown, and great skill was needed to strike the narrow channel squarely in the gloom. From the New York, eager eyes watched the collier until its outlines were lost beneath the shadow of the hills. Eyes continued to peer into the darkness, and ears to listen intently, while a tense anxiety strained the nerves of the watching crew. Then came a booming roar from Morrow Castle, and the flash of a cannon lit up for an instant the gloom. Other flashes and booming sounds followed, and for twenty minutes there seemed a battle going on in the darkness. The Merrimack was under fire. She was meeting her doom. What was the fate of Hobson and his men? Cadet J. W. Powell had followed the collier with a steam launch and four men, prepared to pick up any fugitives from the doomed ship. He went daringly under the batteries and hung about until daylight revealed his small craft, but not a man was seen in the ruffled waters, and he returned disappointed at 6.15 a.m., pestered by spiteful shots from the Spanish guns. He had followed the Merrimack until the low-lying smoke from the roaring guns hid her from view. Then came the explosion of the torpedoes. Hobson had done his work. Powell kept under the shelter of the cliffs until full day had dawned, and before leaving he saw a spar of the Merrimack rising out of the water of the channel. The sinking had been accomplished, but no one could say with what result to Hobson and his men. Let us now leave the distant spectators and go on board the Merrimack, seeking the company of her devoted crew. It was Hobson's purpose to sink her in the narrowest part of the channel, dropping the anchor and handling the rudder so as to turn her across the stream. Her length was sufficient to close up completely the deeper channel. He would stop the engines, let fall the anchor, open the traps made for the seawater to flow in, and explode the torpedoes. Ten of these lay on the port side of the ship, each containing eighty-two pounds of powder, and they were connected so that they could be fired in train. There were two men below, one to reverse the engines, the other to break open the sea traps with the sledgehammer. Those on deck were to let fall the anchor and set the helm. Then Hobson would touch the electric button and fire the torpedoes, and all would leap overboard and swim to the dinghy towing astern, in which they hoped to escape. Such were their plans, but chance, as it so often does, set them sadly astray. On through the darkness they went, hitting the channel squarely, and steaming in under the frowning walls of the morrow through gloom and death-like silence. But the Spaniards were not asleep. A small picket-boat came gliding out under the collier's stern and fired several shots at the suspicious craft. One of these carried away the rudder and spoiled one important item of the plans. The dinghy, which was trusted to for escape, disappeared, perhaps hit by one of these shots. The picket-boat, having done this serious mischief, then hurried ashore and gave the alarm, and quickly the shore batteries were firing on the dark hull. The ships in the harbor echoed the shots with their guns. The Spaniards were alert. They thought that an American battleship was trying to force its way in, perhaps with the whole fleet in its wake, and were ready to give it a hard fight. Through the rain of balls the Merrimack drove on, unhurt by the bombardment, and even by a submarine mine which exploded near her stern. The darkness and her rapid motion rendered her hard to hit, and she reached the desired spot in the narrowest spot of the channel, none the worse for the shower of iron hail. So far all had gone well. Now the critical moment had arrived. Hobson gave the signal fixed upon, and the men below reversed the engine and opened the sea connections. They then dashed for the deck. Those above dropped the anchor and set the helm. Only then did Hobson, to his bitter disappointment, discover that the rudder had been lost. The ship refused to answer her helm, and the plan of setting her lengthwise across the channel failed. The final task remained. Touching the electric button, the torpedoes went off with a sullen roar, and the ship lurched heavily beneath their feet. The sharp roll threw some of the men over the rail, the others leapt into the sea, 
Down went the Merrimack with a surge at the bow, cheers from the forts and the ships greeting her as she sank. The gunners thought that they had sent to the depths one of the hostile men of war. At the last moment of leaving the New York, an old catamaran had been thrown on the Merrimack's deck, as a possible aid to the crew in extremity. This float lay on the roof of the midship house, a rope fastening it to the taffrail, with enough slack to let it float loose after the ship had sunk. It was a fortunate thought for the crew, as it had afforded them a temporary refuge in place of the lost dinghy. We may let Lieutenant Hobson speak for himself at this point in our narrative. He says, I swam away from the ship as soon as I struck the water, but I could feel the eddies drawing me backward in spite of all I could do. This did not last very long, however, and as soon as I felt the tugging cease, I turned and struck out for the float, which I could see dimly bobbing up and down over the sunken hull. The Merrimack's masts were plainly visible, and I could see the heads of my seven men, as they followed my example and made for the float also. We had expected, of course, that the Spaniards would investigate the wreck, but we had no idea that they would be at it as quickly as they were. Before we could get to the float, several rowboats and launches came around the bluff from inside the harbor. They had officers on board, and armed marines as well, and they searched that passage, rowing backward and forward, until the next morning. It was only by good luck that we had got to the float at all, for they were upon us so quickly that we had barely concealed ourselves when a boat with quite a large party on board was right beside us. An event which they thought unlucky now proved to be the salvation of the fugitives who very likely would have been shot on the spot by the marines if they had been seen from the boats. The rope which fastened the float to the ship was too short to let it swing free, and one of the pontoons that supported it was dragged partly under water, lifting the other above the surface. If the raft had lain flat on the water they would have had to climb on top and would have made an excellent mark for the marines. As it was they got under its lifted side, and by thrusting their hands through the slats that formed the deck they kept their heads above water and had a chance to breathe. Luckily for them, the Spaniards paid no attention to the old half-sunken raft that floated above the wreck. They came near it frequently, and the hidden sailors could hear their words, but no one seemed to suspect it. The fugitives spoke only in whispers, and at times were almost afraid to breathe, lest they should be heard, but their hiding place remained unsuspected. The water, warm at first, grew cold as the hours went on, and their fingers ached as they clung desperately to the slats. As the night passed, their teeth began to chatter with the cold, till it seemed to them as if the Spaniards must hear the sound, so distinctly to their ears came the noises on the water and on shore. The situation, in fact, became at last so trying that one of the men let go and began to swim ashore. Hobson called him back, and he obeyed, but the call was heard by the men in the boats and created some commotion. They rowed up towards the float and looked sharply about, but no one thought of investigating the float itself and soon they went off into the shadows again, letting the hidden men once more breathe freely. The question that most interested the Spaniards was to learn what ship it was they had sunk. Hobson heard them talking and guessing about it, and understood many of their words. He soon perceived that the officers had taken in the situation, and were astonished at the boldness and audacity of the attempt. The boats appeared to be from the fleet, a fact of the lieutenant's satisfaction as he felt more like trusting to the tender mercies of a Spanish sailor than of a soldier. At this point we let him take up the narrative again. When daylight came, a steam launch full of officers and marines came out from behind the cliff that hid the fleet and harbor and advanced toward us. All the men on board were looking curiously in our direction. They did not see us. Knowing that someone of rank must be on board, I waited till the launch was quite close and hailed her. My voice produced the utmost consternation on board. Everyone sprang up, the marines now crowded to the bow, and the launch engines were reversed. She not only stopped, but she backed off until nearly a quarter of a mile away where she stayed. The marines stood ready to fire at the word of command when we clambered out from under the float. There were ten of the marines, and they would have fired in a minute had they not been restrained. I swam towards the launch, and then she started towards me. I called out in Spanish, Is there an officer on board? An officer answered in the affirmative, and then I shouted in Spanish again, I have seven men to surrender. I continued swimming and was seized and pulled out of the water. As I looked up when they were dragging me into the launch, I saw that it was Admiral Cervera himself who had hold of me. He looked at me rather dubiously at first, because I had been down in the engine room of the Merrimack, where I got covered with oil, and that, with the soot and coal dust, made my appearance most disreputable. 
I had put on my officer's belt before sinking the Merrimack as a means of identification, no matter what happened to me, and when I pointed to it in the launch, the Admiral understood and seemed satisfied. The first words he said to me when he understood who I was were, Bienvenida se os did, which means you are welcome. My treatment by the naval officers, and that of my men also, was courteous all the time I was a prisoner. They heard my story, as much of it as I could tell, but sought to learn nothing more. Sharks? No, I did not have time to think of them that night, was Hobson's reply to a question. We saw a great many things, though, and went through a great many experiences. When we started out from the fleet, I tied to my belt a flask of medicated water, supplied to me by my ship's surgeon. The frequency with which we all felt thirsty on the short run into the passage and the dryness of my mouth and lips made me believe that I was frightened. The men felt the same, and all the way the flask went from hand to hand. Once I felt my pulse to see if I was frightened, but to my surprise I found it normal. Later we forgot all about it, and when we got into the water there was no need for the flask. The remainder of this stirring adventure must be told more briefly. The prisoners were taken ashore and locked up in a cell in Morrow Castle. Meanwhile there was much anxiety on the fleet as to their fate, but this was relieved by the generous conduct of the Spanish admiral, who sent his chief of staff out the next morning under a flag of truce, to report their safety and to make an offer for their exchange. Cervera's message was highly complimentary. It ran, Admiral Cervera, the commander of the Spanish fleet, is most profoundly impressed with the brilliant courage shown by the men who sank the steamer Merrimack in our harbor, and in admiration of their courage he has directed me to say to their countrymen that they are alive, and with the exception of two of the men who were slightly hurt, they are uninjured. They are now prisoners of war and are being well cared for, and will be treated with every consideration. Cervera kept his word, though the captives found themselves in different hands later, when they were turned over to General Linares, commander of the troops in Santiago. They remained in captivity about five weeks, being exchanged on July 7th, when a Spanish lieutenant and fourteen privates were offered in exchange for Hobson and his gallant seven. The story of their return to the American ranks is an exhilarating one. As the brave eight passed up the trail leading to the American lines through the avenue of palms that bordered the road, the soldiers stood in reverent silence, bearing their heads as the band struck up the star-spangled banner. But as Hobson and his men swung onward, cheers and a roar of welcome broke the silence, while a cowboy yell came from the Rough Riders. Breaking from all restraint, the men rushed in, eagerly grasping the hands of Hobson and his men. All the way to Siboney the cheers and excitement continued, and when Hobson set foot on the deck of the New York, the crew grew wild with enthusiasm, while Admiral Sampson embraced him in the warmth of his greeting. As for his comrades, they were fairly swallowed up in the delirious delight of the men. Thus ended one of the most gallant deeds of that short war. It must be said, however, that skillfully as it had been managed, the effort to close the port proved a failure. Though the sunken ship closed part of the channel, there was room enough to pass beside her this being strikingly proved on the morning of July 3rd, when the squadron which Hobson had sought to bottle up came steaming down the channel past the sunken Merrimack and put out to sea, where it started on a wild fight for freedom. The result of this venture does not need to be retold, and it must suffice to say that a few hours later all the Spanish ships were shell-riddled wrecks on the Cuban shore, and Cervera and all who survived of his men were prisoners in American hands. But the admiral was as much of a hero as a captive, for his captors could not soon forget his generous treatment of Hobson and his men. The End End of Chapter 32 End of Historical Tales, Volume 3, Spanish-American, by Charles Morris